right. Judges chapter 6. And Father, we are so grateful that you love us, that you share your heart through your word to us. And so, God, give us ears to hear it today. I pray for a prophetic word to the hearts of your people, that I will relay your heart to your people that you love so dearly. Help us to have ears to hear, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Judges chapter 6, the title of this message is Courage Under Fire. Courage Under Fire. This is part one of this message. Now, courage can be defined as the mental or moral strength to face a difficulty despite fear, pain, or danger. I say again, courage can be defined as the mental or moral strength to face a difficulty despite fear, pain, or danger. This is the subject of this chapter. We're going to meet a man named Gideon, and God is going to choose him for a task, and he had to do it despite his fear, pain, or how dangerous it was. Let's see what it says there in verse 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Now in this verse, we see the familiar tune that we have seen throughout the book of Judges. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. When the Israelites entered the promised land some 200 years earlier, God told them to destroy all of the nations and do not leave any around or they will be a snare or a trap to you. They did what we so often do and partially obeyed the Lord and left pockets of Canaanites around and here we are 200 years later the Canaanites have regained strength and now they are back in charge controlling and enslaving the Israelites oh the same thing will happen to us as well when God clearly tells us to get rid of something or somebody and we partially obey it is just a matter of time when we will be back enslaved by that person or by that internet site or by that bottle or drug. And the appetit written over your life and mine will be the same as the Israelites. Tony did evil in the sight of the Lord. Judy did evil in the sight of the Lord. James did evil in the sight of of the Lord. Judy did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you beat yourself up and say, why is it that I just keep falling in this area? Because God told you to totally get rid of someone or something and you kept playing around and partially obeying God and you justify it by saying, well, I, I'm not as involved with them as I used to be. Or, you know, give me a little credit here. It's not as bad as it used to be. You should have seen me a year ago. And you try to give your, pat yourself on the back some kind of way. No, God said totally get rid of the Canaanites, and because you didn't, they are fortified and strengthened and now has a serious stronghold in your life. And this is what we're seeing here. Jesus taught us a similar principle in Matthew, uh, right around verse 12, in verses 43 to 45. He said, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, he seeks to try to dwell somewhere else. And when he can't find anywhere to dwell, he says, oh, let me go back to where I came from. And he takes seven more demons, more wicked than himself. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. See, when we don't 
totally obey the Lord and we partially obey him, those Canaanites and Midianites will strengthen. And then next thing you know, they're back controlling us. They're back in charge because they've been fortified. They've been strengthened. And they're back doing their thing. When, when we just kind of just leave it lingering around, next thing you know, over a period of time, they're back with a stronghold. And we need to be careful of that. Uh, the last part of verse 1 says that Israel's new enemy was uh, the Midianites. Now, who were they? Midian was the son of Abraham through his wife, Keturah. Keturah was Abraham's wife when Sarah died. So to keep his six sons that he had with Keturah away from Isaac, the son of promise, he sent Keturah's sons away and they constantly became enemies of Israel. Watch this. Carrying years of bitterness and animosity towards Israel for being sent away. I was thinking about this this afternoon. And I've seen this happen with a lot of people. A lot of people like you who are adults right now. And I've seen where there are a lot of adults now. Who are really little kids on the inside. Because a parent cast you to side, and they went off and started a new family and, 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 and forgotten about you. And over years, you've grown up with, a, with an anger, with an, with an animosity. And, and, and this, this is what happened to Midian. And now he birthed the Midianites. And now they're, they're oppressing Israel. All because back in the day, Abraham wanted to guard precious Isaac. So he sent the six sons with Keturah, sent them away. And didn't want them to influence Isaac in any kind of way. And I've seen where there are Children who now look like you, adults, with still that animosity on the inside for how a parent left. And they went on and started a new family and forgot all about you. And now here you are, grown with your own Midianite carrying animosity and anger. And, and, you know, the Lord wants to heal your wounded heart from this because Jesus promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he wants to heal you from that animosity and anger you're carrying. And I'm just bringing it to the surface by talking about it. Oh, you, you got these issues, and it's all because of what has happened long ago. And you don't really talk about it, but I'm bringing it up because it's real in your heart. It's real in your life because now you're an adult, and your name is Midian, and you have birthed little Midianites, and then that animosity and anger is going to be carried on through them. And the Lord wants to deal with it in your heart. So it can halt in your life so it's not passed on to the Midianites. And I was thinking about this this afternoon. Look what he says there in verse 2. He says, And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves dens and caves and strongholds, which are in the mountains. Now, the reason why the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel is because history tells us that the Midianites were the first ones to domesticate the camel. Camels were really good at maneuvering in battle. 
And because of their fear of the Midianites, the Israelites, they hid in caves, dens, and strongholds. Oh, this is also the reason why the enemy of our soul, Satan, has a stronghold on us at times because he grips us with fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Oh, Satan grips us with fear and worry, and he has us hiding in caves and dens and strongholds. If not ourselves, but especially our children. We are afraid of the Midianites of this world, so we hide our children in the dens of homeschooling until they are 20 years old because we're afraid uh, that the worldly schools will corrupt them. Oh, out of fear. We keep our children hidden in the dens of our homes and, and will not let them play with the Midianite children in the neighborhood in fear that they might get corrupted. Now, I am not saying that we shouldn't be careful and watchful and, and protective over our children, nor am I saying that you, you shouldn't homeschool your children. Just keep in mind that Moses went to the public schools of Egypt. But what his mother, Yoshebed, put in his heart about God came back into his heart when he was 40 years old. I'm just saying, don't allow fear to cause you to hide your children in caves, dens, and strongholds. Oh, we tried it. Hey, you, you, you're talking to someone who did this. We tried to hide our children from the world, and they were still corrupted by the world. They knew the top secular songs, movies, and terms. They didn't get it from our home, but nonetheless, they knew these things. And I know what you're thinking. See, Pastor Tony, this is why we're doing what we're doing to protect them. We're called to be responsible parents, but we can't totally shield them from the world. They must be tested. Their faith must be put to test one day. You can keep them in a bubble all you want until they're 25, 30 years old. They're going to have to be tested one day. In other words, one day they will have to leave the dens, caves, and strongholds of your home and go out into the world and mingle with the Midianites where their faith will be tested. Some tests, they will fail miserably, and some, they will pass. Life, I always, I always say life is a classroom. It's going to teach us some incredible lessons, the same way with our children. But remember, if you taught them God's word, underline that statement. If you taught them God's wor word, it will not return void. It's going to accomplish the work it was sent out to do in their lives. So don't worry. Leave them in God's hands. I'm not saying you can't homeschool your kids and all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that. You can protect them. I don't care how old you let them finally leave your bubble. They're going to be put to the test. Satan will see to it, and God will allow it, because faith must be tested. How do you know if faith is genuine unless it's tested? Oh, you educators, you know. How do you know the kids are learning the lesson that you taught them all year, and you, they have to take a test, SOLs and all kind of other mess they got to take. SATs when they're seniors, you know, stuff. I'm looking at the SAT. I said, what is this stuff? What? I didn't do well with an SAT test. <laughs> Some people are, are not good test takers. I was, because I had a, a great memory, everything, you know, because everything is recall, everything is audio. Well, when I was going to school, you know, you got a teacher up there lecturing, and it's audio. And, I, you know, I had a great, great memory. I just remember things. You know, I read the chapter, take the test the next day. I remember it. So I did well. Even though I didn't do well on the SAT test, I had an academic scholarship to Indiana State. 
So that just meant they looked at that, they looked at my grades, looked at either he cheated or, <laughs> or he's not a good test taker. And they found out I wasn't a good, you know, wasn't good test, that kind of test taker. I was a great recall test. But that SAT, I think y'all take the ACT down here? What y'all take down here? Take both. When they start mixing things up, when they do all that, I take both. What's wrong with y'all? Oh, <laughs> why didn't we take both? What if I wanted to go to school down here? Y'all took that ACT. What? I, hey, whatever. I'm one. They definitely wasn't gonna take both of those tests. I couldn't do the first one. Let alone, it. I took it twice too. But don't worry. Parents, don't worry. You'll be, your kids going to be okay if you taught them the word of God. If you didn't teach them the word of God, worry, worry. <laughs> Bite your nails down. Worry. And hope that what they learned the hour or two they came here will stick. Because God's word would not return void. Look at verses 3 through 6. It says, so it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the uh, produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, uh, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. And for they would come up with their livestock and their uh, tents coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, in these verses, we see that every time the Israelites harvested, uh, harvested their crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites will come up against them, according to verse 3. And they will come up and destroy the produce and leaving nothing for the Israelites. They will even take their sheep and their oxen and, and donkey, according to verse 4. Uh, in verse 5, they will come up without number like locusts and with their camels and destroy the land. So they were impoverished. Then the end of verse 6 says, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. That, you know, we, we have been seeing this theme throughout this book. Why is it that we have to wait until we are greatly impoverished before we cry out to the Lord? Notice how long they were in this condition before they cried out to the Lord. Verse 1 says, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Seven years of being greatly impoverished before they cried out to the Lord? Oh, we do the same thing with bad relationships, partnerships, and friendships. We will stay connected to these people for years before we cry out to the Lord to deliver us. You know why? I, I was thinking about this this afternoon as well. You know why? Because so often we think that we can fix it. See, that's the thing we need to see. So often we think we can fix it. We say, I got myself into this mess and I can get myself out of it. No, you cannot. Cry out to the Lord. See, it, it, I, I just, it, it is an amazing thing. It is the deception of Satan to tell us to do it yourself. You don't need the Lord. You, you got yourself into this? Get yourself out of it. It's the old pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality. Hey, you got yourself in this mess. You know, you told God you wouldn't do it again, and here you are again. And so therefore, you know, just do it yourself, and you just get deeper. See, Satan keep you, he, he keeps you independent of the Lord instead of dependent upon him. Just do it without God. You know, you, you told him you wouldn't do it. You did it again. So just get yourself out of it. And then we, we try. We try it next year. You know, years have gone by. And we're still in a bad relationship. You're still in a bad friendship, partnership. You're still in a bad situation. 
And you're like, oh, but one day I'm going to get out. And you're still there. Seven years later, here they are, impoverished for seven years. I don't know about you, I like to eat. You think I'm going parvish, you know, where my, my stomach is touching my back for seven years and me not cry out to the Lord? I miss one meal. I'm like, Lord, I need you. I need thee every hour. I need thee. I, but, hey. And, 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 and we, we stay in this impoverished state. It is, it, it is just amazing to me. Look at verses 7 through 10. It says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and, and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Notice how verse 7 says, when they cried out to the Lord, he sent a prophet to them in verse 8, and God began to rehearse in their hearing what he did for them when he brought them out of Egypt in verse 9. Then the Lord reminded them in verse 10, he says, I am the Lord your God, do not fear the gods of, of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, implying that they were afraid or they allowed fear to cause them to disobey God. How do I know? Because the end of verse 10 says, but you have not obeyed my voice. Fear will definitely cause us to disobey the voice of the Lord. There are many couples living together and not married, and God said, get out of that situation. However, because they are afraid of what will happen to them and their children, if she puts him out, he's helping to pay the bills, buying the groceries. I am afraid of being homeless with my children. I am afraid of being alone. So fear is causing people to disobey God. The Lord says, put in your two weeks notice. This job has you working every Sunday and every Wednesday. And you can never go to church. And you never spend time with your family. But you're still there because you're afraid you might not be able to find another job. And you begin to talk like the world. It's a recession. Things are bad. Fear causes us to disobey God. And so they cried out to the Lord, and he sends a prophet. Now, this time, God himself is about to come down. Look what it says in verses 11 through 18. Now, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, with, uh, which belonged to Joash, the Abizrite. Uh, while uh, his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then, then why has all this happened to us? And, and where are all the, his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord uh, has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in uh, Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk, uh, talk with me. 
Uh, do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. Now, in these verses, we see the Lord came down in the form of the angel of the Lord. This is commonly called a theophany or a Christophany, a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. We see this in verse 11. He sat under the terebinth tree in Oprah uh, while Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now, if you will pay attention to how the Lord calls people into service, I want you to notice something. They are always, the people God calls into service, they are always busy doing something. David was attending his father's sheep. Peter and John were fishing and mending their nets. Same with James and John. You know, his, his brother James were also involved in the fishing business. Uh, Matthew was busy doing his tax collecting work. It is rare that someone is sitting around doing nothing and God calls them. It is usually people uh, like Gideon threshing wheat, and the Lord said to him in verse 12, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now hold up now. Mighty man of valor? Gideon is gripped with fear that the Midianites would swoop down at any moment and steal all of his crops that he just finished hiding. Mighty man of valor? Yes. Because God sees what we can become in him. You remember in John chapter 1, verse 42, Jesus sees, uh, he sees Simon and says, you shall be called Cephas or Peter. Cephas is, is the Aramaic form of Peter, which means rock. Now, Peter was far from being a rock. I can tell you that at that stage of his life. But Jesus saw what he can become in him as he walked with him and drew closer with him, he will definitely become that rock. Oh, the same is true in our lives. Yes, we might be a mess up or afraid at this very moment, but God sees us as a mighty man or mighty woman of valor or as a rock like Peter. So just keep walking with Jesus and seeing yourself the way God sees you. He sees what you can become in him as you walk closer and closer with him, as you spend time in prayer and the word of God and walk with him. He sees what you can become in him. Oh, you're a mess up now and a hot mess. I can co-sign with that but he sees what you can become in him. He sees you studying the word and praying and drawing close to him that when people get around you like the disciples, like it says in Acts 4.13, oh, they knew that they had been with Jesus. There are people around you that God wants you to mingle with, and when they're around you, they want to, they're going to say, no, this person has been with Jesus. And it's not by the myriad of scriptures you can quote or by how many times you can say hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord, too blessed to be stressed kind of stuff. <laughs> it's beyond that kind of gibberish that we so often equate to spirituality. But they know just by being around you that something's different. And what little bit that they know about Jesus, they know that they see that in you. That's what the Lord wants to do. This is how we're going to change this world one person at a time. It's by us being with Jesus. And that when we get around other folks, they will know something that's different about us. But if we're fooling around, partying with them on the weekend, drinking and smoking and cutting up and cussing and fooling around. But that's, 
all you got to do is just say, would Jesus do that? Nah. Then, then we don't do it. And then when you find yourself, you slip, you fail, just get up and just say, Lord, oh, Lord, forgive me. And get back up and keep it pushing. Keep it pushing. And so here we see God calling him a mighty man. Gideon responded to God in verse 13, says, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all of this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which we have heard about? Now, there are many people who sound just like Gideon. If God is so true and so real, then why is there all the evil occurring in the world and in my life? What about all of the miracles I heard about in that Bible of yours? Where are they? Now listen to how God answers Gideon in verse 14. It's amazing. He said, the Lord uh, turned to him and said, go in the might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? The Lord doesn't even answer this question. <laughs> he didn't even answer it. Instead, he just commissioned him to go. Go save Israel. Be worrying about some why I didn't do a certain thing and that, that. Hey, you just go and do what I told you to do. This shows us that there are some questions we have that will not get answered on this side of heaven. Do you know why? Let me tell you why. Uh, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. This, this is verses like this that sets me free because when I was very, um, when I was younger in ministry, I thought I had to have all of the answers to all of the questions of the world. And then now as I get older, I just smile at my little self. Sometime when pictures of my wife and I, you know, come up when we were teenagers, uh, something come up on social media, and I just say, oh, I wish I could talk to that young man right now. Oh, he'd think he's young and all that, you know, and just, I need to talk to that kid right there. Let me tell you, there are some questions we're just not going to know. And it's okay. It's, it doesn't make God look bad. That's what I used to think. I can't make God look bad. I got to come up with an answer. You know. I, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. In other words, the Lord is saying, in essence, if I told you why I do certain things or don't do other things, you will say, huh? I don't get it. That's right, because my ways and thoughts are higher and above your thoughts and ways. Just remember, tuck this in your back pocket. Just remember Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever. That we may do all the words of his law. God said he's going to reveal just enough to us so we can obey him. There's some things about God we're not going to know. We're not going to know. And, and, and it's okay. I didn't think it was okay not to know. I, I thought I had to have all the answers. No. No, let God be God. If you had all the answers, maybe you're God. I know you think you are, but you're not. You're not. Gideon responded to the Lord in verse 15. He says, how can I save Israel? And I am the least of my father's house. Hey, Gideon, it's not about you, bro. Maybe you got to twist it. Because the Lord responded in verse 16 and says, surely I will be with you. And you shall defeat the Midianites. See, this is the key of being used mightily by God. It's not a matter of who you are, but it's a matter of who he is. See, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29, it tells us why God has chosen us. So before you think that he, he, he got a really good prize in you, 
These verses say God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the base things and the things that are despised and the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? Verse 29 says, so no flesh will glory or boast in his presence. This is why he chose you and he chose me. The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The things that are despised. <laughs> and the things that are not or the things that are nothing. You're nothing. I'm nothing. That's why he chose us. That's why he doesn't have all these great, mighty intellectuals. Now, there's been some great, mighty intellectuals that have been Christians throughout the years. But that's, not the, that's the exception, not the rule. The rule is he chooses people like us. Why? So no flesh will glory. See, if God just used all the wise and heady people, then when God uses them, the ordinary people like us will say, oh, that's why he used them, because he's so smart. And he can never use me because I can never have an intellect like that. And no, God uses us. Simple, foolish, despised, base things. Now, I know you think you're more than that. The Bible says that we're, we're but dust. And he's the one who breathed in us the breath of life. And he uses us. This is amazing. It's an amazing thing. So no flesh will glory in his presence. So please understand it's about him and it's not about you. It's not about me. I am amazed that God uses me. I'm blown away by this. The things that God has done in my life the past, I would say since 2015, ah, I could have never dreamed of it. Never dreamed of it. I'm, I'm a, it's all about, it's definitely ain't about me. It's all about him. You know, I say this because so often we're like Gideon. So often we, we can be afraid. Our knees are knocking, unsure, talking about our upbringing like he did. I'm the least in my father's house. Put it in terms that we can understand. He said, I'm the baby boy. So how can God use me? I'm baby boy. I'm the least in my family. God says, it has nothing to do with you. And because you baby boy, that's why I'm using you. So it could be all about me. I, I, I thought about this briefly before service. And I, I didn't get a chance to think it through. But it was just briefly something I thought about. It's something how God uses baby boys. The least. David. When all the brothers came, you know, in front of Samuel. Says, truly the Lord is in that first one, boy. That's a big strapping young man. He's the... He's, a, he's the firstborn. And that's when God said that famous verse in, verse in uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Had all the brothers pass by. And he said, okay, God, you, you said it was one of these brothers. And, you, know, you have any more? He said, oh, I got one boy out there with those sheep out there. He, he's ruddy, ruddy, he's good looking. And, you know, he's just a little boy out there. And then he said, bring him in. God said, boom. That's the one. Bam. That's the one I want. Baby boy. And I just look at how God uses baby. Gideon. Baby boy. Me. <laughs> baby boy. <laughs> and God uses us. Uh, so no flesh will glory in this presence. So don't go out here with your chest out and say, I'm baby boy too. You blew it. The purpose of baby boy is to know you, you're low. You, you the least, you the one that nobody expected. You ain't nothing to be proud about. Because, you know, for us who are baby boys, here we are fully grown, and we still call my, my baby brother right here. And y'all older folks, y'all think that's cute. To still be referring to us as little brother, baby brother, baby boy. 
we fully grown now. We thought we outgrew that, but for you older siblings, yo, y'all, yeah, some y'all got it twisted still, some kind of way. But it's amazing. Here he is. God said, "It's not about you. It has everything to do with me, and that's why I chose you. You're the least in your clan, and you're baby boy, and that's why I'm choosing you." Amazing thing. Gideon is still unsure in verse 17. He asked for a sign. Now, there is nothing wrong with asking the Lord for confirmation like we see Gideon doing here. And many people uh, jump out and do something for God and it didn't and, and didn't get confirmation and fell flat on their faces. Gideon goes into verse 18. Um, he goes in, should I say, in verse 18 to prepare an offering that we will see what happened, God's will, next week if, if it's not an ice storm, Lord. <laughs> you know. I, I told my wife I was so set free. I used to get so angry at God when there's some kind of snowstorm Saturday night, especially Sunday morning, or when there's something going Wednesday and we have to cancel service. I'd be so angry at God. Y'all just don't know. I'd be at my house stewing. I'm just smoke coming out of my head and said, God, why would you do it on this time? Because you know those folks are not going to come out. If, they, if we say we haven't service them, you know they're not going to come out. And, you know, I told my wife just today, I said, I'm so set free. I said, you know what? It's, it's threatening an a, a ice storm next week. I said, I ought to cancel next week just on a threat. <laughs> I'm just set free. I'm set free now. Storm, Saturday night. Ah, okay, get to sleep in today. Sleep in on Sunday. I'm, I'm, so, I'm set free now. No longer am I angry with God. I'm like, y'all, I was, I used to get ticked at God. And I would be doing the smoke coming out of my head. But God set me free. Set free. So, supposed to be a snow, I mean, snowstorm or ice storm next week. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Just know. At the threat, I'm counseling. At the threat. <laughs> Sit at home, catch the beginning of an NBA game. <laughs> fool around like y'all fool around. I'm a fool around. I'm one of y'all now. I'm one of y'all. I'm not biting my nails. Do we have to? I'm a fool around with y'all. Give me some big popcorn. See the tip off and enjoy myself. Is that free? <laughs> Let me conclude with this. Courage under fire. Here we see God preparing to use Gideon to do a great work for him. Don't forget that God sees what we can become in him as we submit our lives more and more to his will. So daily draw close to God. Try to draw closer to the Lord in prayer. Try to get alone some kind of way. You single parents, I, I know this can be tough at times. Try to get alone some kind of way. You know, I, I always used to joke how you, single parents, not even single parents, just mothers, period, how sometimes you try to go to the restroom just to get away, and, and you, you see fingers coming under the door. <laughs> and, and if you touch it one time, the game is on. <laughs> you know the game is on. So <laughs> it was funny. My, my, my son, who, you know, a, a single parent, and he sent us a picture of Bella's hand under the door, like this, and I just fell out laughing. Be, be, that, be, and he said he touched it one time. It, it, the game was on. But try to get along. Try to get along some kind of way in order to draw closer to the Lord. We also saw that it is not about us and our good or bad upbringing or where we are in the pecking order of the family. It's not about any of those things. It's about the Lord using us. So take your eyes off of your abilities or lack thereof and submit to God's will for your life. Finally, don't allow fear to keep you and your children in dens, caves, and strongholds. For God to use us, we must come out and thresh wheat like Gideon and get busy doing something for the Lord 
And soon, God will come and tap us on the shoulder to do something greater for him. May God use us. May we prepare our hearts to be used by the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time that we can just share your word, hear your heart. And God, we just pray that you would draw your people to you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not repented of their sin and accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today will be the day of salvation for them. Draw them to you, Lord. I pray for those who are gripped with fear. They're afraid that their children might be corrupted by this world. I pray, God, that they will bring that fear to the foot of the cross. And Lord, I pray that we would take our eyes off of us and put them on you. Because, Lord, you have chosen us so you can get the glory. Lord, thank you for the great work you're doing in our lives. Lord, I pray for a deeper and greater work to be done. Do a work we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.